Yes. Okay, we will uh, call to order the April 1st study session of the uh, CBS Board of Directors. Uh, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll make the sound. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll begin with the. Uh, Mr. Buckley? Yeah. Mr. Meckley? Here. Mr. Souter? Here. Ms. Krug? Here. Mr. Flickinger? Here. Mrs. Swope? Here. Mrs. Here. Miller? Here. Mr. Getz? Here. And Mr. Kinshu? Present. Thank you. Thank you. For members of the public, there will be uh, two opportunities for the public to provide comments to the board. Uh, the first opportunity for speakers registered in advance of the meeting to speak on agenda related items. Second opportunity occurs at the end of the meeting for any speakers wishing to comment on non-agenda district uh, related topics. All public comments will be limited to three minutes in, le in length. We will have a timer uh, for you to keep track of your time. Please state your name and municipality uh, for the record and direct all comments to the board uh, president and vice president. Please note that the board will be listening, but please do not expect an immediate response. Further action is needed to superintend and follow up with you. Thank you. I also want to announce that uh, we will be after uh, today's tonight's meeting, uh, we will be having an executive session to discuss personnel issues. And we'll move right on to the first agenda item, which is the Crabtree and Rohrbaum, uh, New Oxford Elementary, Conawaga Township Elementary uh, design update. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, for our presentation tonight, we're going to give you a uh, on some of the things that we've been doing uh, as far as uh, assembling a team, meetings with uh, the administration, meetings with the faculty and students. Uh, we had a couple of building tours that we've gone through in the past two months that we wanted to to show the administration some projects that we thought were relevant and similar to yours. So we wanted to show you, uh, give you a virtual tour of it. So uh, make the best use of your time that we can show you some of the photographs. And then we're gonna give you an update on the schematic design. Uh, we'll look at the floor plans and we'll look at the site plans. And then we'll talk to you a little bit about what the next steps are with uh, design. So uh, our, our designs were mostly conceptual in nature, and then we start to move in the schematic design where we want to make sure that we have all the classroom space accounted for. We're also talking with the facilities department to make sure that we have the support spaces that we need. And we have a little bit of a change to NOE from the original design that we had showed you. Um, I'll show that later on the presentation, but we think that it's a good design and it's gonna help keep some construction costs uh, down. Uh, we have our civil engineer, K&W engineers. They actually tomorrow have a meeting with the local municipality for Conalago Township uh, Elementary. So we're gonna start to understand what the requirements are to get land development and if there's uh, any zoning variances that we need to go through. And that meeting, um, they'll share a, a sketch plan um, and explain to them 
this is the scope of work, get an idea of what their approval process looks like and how long it's gonna take. And this is gonna dictate how long the design schedule needs to be. So how long is it gonna take for us to get land development and the NPDES permit through the county? Uh, so they have that meeting tomorrow morning. The district does have uh, Matt uh, is attending with the civil engineer. And at the same time, we're meeting with the administration so that when they're finished, they're going to rush back over to the district admin office and then give us an update. Uh, we also had our MEP, our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineer, which is more engineering. They met with uh, they met with Jeff to talk about the building systems and the systems that he wants to see implemented into the design. And sometimes um, what's also important is knowing what systems or manufacturers you don't want. Sometimes it's just as important as knowing what you do want. So what they do with, uh, with that meeting is they develop a basis of design. So this is the systems that he wants to see, the, um, the manufacturers, and then kill those engineers will use that input that Jeff gave them to start their design work. So it's just a little bit more of Jeff talking and then the engineers listening, and then they put together a, a document. We're gonna review that with Jeff tomorrow to make sure that what they heard was correct. Uh, so Jeff, that's been on, hmm? Jeff, Jeff. You're, you're a facilities director. So the building tours that we went on, we visited a school in Ken Manor School District outside of Millersville, an elementary school um, in Mechanicsburg for Cumberland Valley School District, and then a school in Mechanicsburg, uh, Mechanicsburg Area School District. The Penn Manor and the Cumberland Valley projects were new construction. The one in Mechanicsburg was an additions or renovations project. So the administration got to see, okay, here is a building that went through a renovation, the transformation that occurs that when you walk through it, it looks, you know, mostly looks like a new building. So we thought that that was very beneficial for, um, for the administration to, uh, to take a look at that. And then one of the next steps that we're gonna be doing is adding to our design team. Uh, we're going to send out RFPs for a structural engineer. The structural engineer is part of our basic services. Uh, so they're already included within our fee. Uh, but we also need a food service consultant and a food service consultant would be a supplemental service. So we'll get two or three proposals and what we'll do is we'll present them to the administration and then ask the administration to get authorization and approve from you to hire that food service consultant so the school tours this is winding creek elementary school if you're ever on 81 really close to the interchange of 581 and 81 outside of mechanicsburg you can see this school from the highway. Uh, we did this project along with Mountain View Middle School simultaneously. This is on a 130 acre uh, property. This district is growing uh, tremendously. Uh, they're gonna have 800 students per grade level uh, pretty soon in, in all of the grades. So this has uh this is K through five. It's about 900, 950 students. I want to add this. This was the second lowest cost per square foot school built in the state in 2016. The school across the street, the middle school, was the lowest cost per square foot school built in the state. So the the, build, the way the building is organized is it has a main street, similar to what we've been talking with your projects, in particular NOE, that when you walk in, you have to go through the administration area, but there is a main street corridor that separates the public spaces, the big box assembly spaces, from the academic spaces. So you'll see the cafeteria is right there on the left, 
If you go further down, uh, that is, um, that's the gymnasium. Further down from that is the library. And then to the right-hand side are all the academic spaces. So they're, they're like fingers where there's uh, three academic wings and each wing holds two grade levels. So in addition to um, the general classrooms, they also have what they call a uh, learning common spaces. So these are act as LGIs that a grade level or a couple of classes within a grade level can use a space that they want to share resources or you have a couple of teachers that want to do some activities or if a teacher wants to get students out of the classroom and they may do some um, they may do some exercises or some assignments where, you know, kids can get on the carpet. Um, this one in particular is strictly for the fifth grade. Um, so the fifth grade has their own, but second and uh, first share one and then third and fourth share one. And they're they're a little bit larger, I think, if you go to the next slide, that might be, nope, this is the gymnasium. Um, so one of the things we talked about with the gymnasium at this school compared to where we're looking to put the gymnasium at NOE is how it's oriented in that space. That is it across from the bleachers or is it at the end of, uh, of the, the basketball court? Um, talking with the administration, it's it's nice to see this that it's like you know this is this isn't how we want ours to be laid out. So again, it's just as important to know what you don't like as it is to know what you like. So after seeing this, uh, the building principal thought the stage would be best served put opposite of the bleachers, so that when he has an assembly and he gets the entire student population in there. He can have some kids sit on the floor, but other kids sit on the bleachers and they're across from the stage. So the next one, this is Broad Street Elementary for Mechanicsburg Area School District. This was the additions and renovations project. And you can, you can kind of see that on the left-hand side, that one-story academic wing, that was an existing building had a roof replacement, gutters and downspouts, new windows, and then the right-hand side, that is, that's an addition, that's the new main entrance. So with the height of that main entrance and the signage and the canopy, it's very clear as to where you enter into the building. So in the architectural language like speaks to the visitors, this is, this is where I, this is where I come in. Yeah, so as I noted, the left-hand side, that is uh, the existing academic wing, and then there was another existing academic wing that's further back. And then you can see the new addition with that higher volume is that main street that separates some of the academic spaces from the assembly spaces. And then there was a new academic wing also off to the right. So this is just a one-story building. That was very similar to um, to CTE and NOE. <laughs> that building, if I remember from the Keystones, 1955 facility. Yeah, so very nice. similar yep. um, to how ours was built. Yes. So this is the uh, this is the media center right off of the main street. So when you look down outside into into the lobby, you can see the entrance and the administration. Uh, beyond. Um, one of the things that we'll do is our interior design group will uh, put the, the uh, uh, space layout and furniture. Uh, we'll propose some um, library furniture, loose seating, tables and chairs, but that will be part of your furniture package, which is bid separately typically during construction. Uh, most of the library casework we will include in the, in the bid. 
Um, but you know, that's one thing that we want to make sure that it is a holistic design that we're looking at the furniture as well as the casework that we can make sure that you know you're buying furniture that matches the color scheme within within the suite. And then that's just looking at the other, looking the other yeah. way. Yeah. So that's looking at the other way in the media center. One of the things we talked a lot about was the color schemes. And we always have this disclaimer that we say, we will not take a personal, if you walk through one of our schools and you say, we don't like the colors because that is really something that we want our clients <laughs> to have input on and we know that maybe one district may prefer one color yeah. and another district may love a certain color so we've talked to dr perry about maybe trying to avoid some of the really saturated bright color and go with more warm tones and then this is one of the flex breakout spaces so similar to the one that you saw at Cumberland Valley, um, this is a breakout space in one of the academic wings. Doesn't have quite the volume or the size, but you can get one or two classrooms in this space. This is in the academic wing. So one of the things that we make sure is the academic wings have the ability to be closed off in the event of emergency that the doors that lead down that corridor are all in magnetic hold opens that they act as fire doors, but they're also tied into the security system as well. Um, and this space, again, teachers can bring students out here. We find that um, the districts want to put a variety of furniture. So it could be a combination of soft seating along with tables and chairs, and that there's an instructional wall and storage, and then maybe even a sink that is needed for some type of cleanup. So we're concentrating, I'm sorry, Kathleen, we're concentrating a lot on these open air areas here. Um, we heard from one of our um, attendees a couple state um, meetings ago that they're finding in, I think it was their high school that they're doing that, that is kind of unusable space for them. Do we find that we're seeing a lot of this being incorporated in elementary school because of the grade level? And do we have the space and is it going to cost us more to have these extra spaces? In yeah, so, so point of the, the point of those tours that is that you know, we, we show an idea right. that other districts have. Yeah. And then, you know, well, and that's guys, what I'm our, we decided like with, with the administration and the principals, are they yeah. seeing benefit in this? Like, is that why we're concentrating on, on sharing that? Yeah. So um, all the, all those districts, all those building principals, they use them for different functions. Okay. Um, and as they explain how they use it, mm -hmm. then your building principals are thinking, if we had this space, this is what we could use it for. Okay. Um, I'm just making sure that we're seeing valid mm -hmm. purposes. So yeah, we don't want to we don't want to include something in a design. Right. And that in theory everybody thinks it's a great idea. Yeah. But then you don't it's, use it and it's wasted space. space. Right. So we want to make sure right. that yeah, it's potentially yeah. maybe even like a cultural change within the school. And that faculty members also are part of the design. Right, and right. That you can have some of them that they champion the idea as well. Okay. So Cumberland Valley, they actually their their large group instruction spaces. That building was built um, 2016 to 2018. They used those learning commons during COVID to keep students. With social Separated distance, yeah, um, and and 
So they, they, so they did find that, benefit to it. Okay. Benefits that right. were not even discussed. Okay. They were just happy accidents. Yeah. I just well, I just like I said that that was more of a high school, and it seemed yeah. very googly or Amazony, you know, with the way that they were using it. So I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're still seeing. in the initial stage. Like we don't have a recommendation yet for yeah. the board about that. But what I'm thinking about is is this helped us to have these spaces, which we already do in CBIS, right, yeah. in each of our team areas and each of our floors. But that's extraordinarily helpful. So we already know culturally how our teachers and how our students are using those spaces, which I appreciate. You know, that has helped us talk, particularly from a capacity perspective. So all the way back then, we were looking at CDIS at 104% capacity, mm -hmm. but then when we consider how it is that we're using our spaces um, that were a part of that project, it helped to, to lower that. Makes the school feel bigger. It does, it does. And it enables the opportunity for kids to be within the visual sight line of their teachers that still be working on a project outside. So when we see spaces like this, a couple of things that, you know, that we debriefed about was, that's an interesting space to see adults and children learning and working together. So you can have a group of teachers meeting, and then you can have a group of students meeting. You can have aides working with students. It's just a learning scholar area. Okay. Um, potentially, we talked about, and also STEM projects. You know, so a place that's a little bit bigger and wider, as you know, as opposed to the media center. Right. But you know, to incorporate, and now that we have the steel standards coming on board, um, we're going to be doing a lot more with our STEM program. Okay. All the way through. So we're just trying to look out ahead at how could we use these spaces and, you know, but we don't have a recommendation yet. And we like the idea to, yeah. to continue to explore it, particularly because the CBIS and it's been helpful, you know, through COVID as well, um, but also just how we practically use it. So is the soft idea at the moment to have one of these at each grade level or one in the school? So I'm going to answer that. Yeah. So right now, the only topic that's that was just more of a result of eliminating, making sure that all classrooms had natural data. So there's two classrooms that are in the old part of CTB that were relocated because they didn't have an exterior wall. Um, and as a result of that, now you're left over with this space. So, well, there's been discussions, how do we use this space? And at future meetings um, later this month, we're gonna start sharing some ideas. We already got some feedback from the building principals on this is how I'd like to see it, but now we have to put design together. Um, we've talked about it at NOE, but it's not quite made its way into the plan because we need a little bit more direction on, okay, if we, what are you going to use it for? And depending on what you use it for, could dictate where it's located in the building. So still more to, still more to come. So it's, it's, what I'm hearing, it's still more of a singular for school and not so much. Um, like the way Hanover Middle has like the pods and then like yeah. the or even our CBIS, right? For yeah. Center thing, it's like one. It space. could, well, and I know, uh, excuse me, it's CTE right now, uh -huh. just one. Uh -huh. But until we know more on how, if you want them or how you would utilize them, then we'll determine if it's, you know, there's only one in the entire school or, and, you know, one of the things I, I guess I didn't really mention is that um, how would you want it sized? Do you want it sized to bring a couple of classes together? That was or kind of do my you next want question. it sized so it's smaller that it's more of like a small group instruction and maybe only half of, half of a class? You had said like something about it's only big enough for like one class. Yeah. And that, that made me question, well, then what's the purpose of the space? Right. right. The kid yeah. class has the class. Well, the, you know, the, these are not for these are for about four two, yeah. These are for like two uh, two classrooms. 
the ones at Cumberland Valley, you can get a lot of a lot of kids in them. Um, the one that we're going to see at the next uh, at the next school, they're able to get their entire grade level to. Too. And that's something that they requested ahead of time because they had like forward thinking, yeah. Yeah. like this, we want this, we're going to use it as a uh, And where we are, what I'm hearing is it's on the table, but we don't know. We need to continue the discussions right. with the architects, with the staff to figure out what that looks like. So it goes back to kind of the trouble part. They're still up here and we don't know what that yeah, is. My, so my concern would be that now, the whole purpose of the building plans is to house the students that we need to house and not have, you know, we're losing classroom space potentially with our special education students right. growing. And I mean, yeah. you know that's what I mean? Part, yeah, that's part of that. Oh, oh yeah. Well, and, and I was, for this? yeah, that's where I was, that's where I was going with my initial question was, do we have the space? However, I am hearing that we're going to need one of our spaces potentially, whether it's the media center or whatever, has the space to spread out for things like STEM projects because we're not going to fit that on a desk. So right. it's okay. That, that it makes sense to keep it on the table. I just but it's not it's wanted not your more. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we need this uh, near. Yeah, right. right. I just wanted to make sure I was touching base on it because yeah. we're we're looking at a new yeah. school. So I was like, okay, that's because it, it's new. new but that's Even good. Though it's on the table, it's not like a quick. If we come up with ten reasons we could use this, then we can get it. Right, like us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Doctor Perry. Yeah. Like yeah. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that that was that was my that was the reason I brought that up. So thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. So this is a uh, Hambright Elementary School. This is in Penn Manor, right outside of Millersville. This elementary school is located on their middle school campus. It's a pretty large campus out, you know, Lancaster County farmland. Um, talking with the building principal, they have, they told your principal that they have a very similar amount of car riders for drop off and pick up so they can kind of see their queuing line. Uh, this is a one story building. This is K through. K through five, I think. Um, interesting that this was done in 2014. So I took Cumberland Valley School District to look at this school and they saw the large group breakout space at this school and said, we what? want that in our school, but this is how we want to do it. So if you go to the next slide, so this is the main entrance. Um, uh, the main lobby, looking down the corridor towards um, towards the back of the building. Um, you know, a lot of natural daylight. There is some ability to go in between the academic, same layout as, as Winding Creek, where public spaces, assembly spaces on one side, academic wings that are like the fingers on the other, a lot of natural daylight, some ability to go out in between the classroom wings, if you want to have students go outside. Um, Winding Creek had something similar as well uh, for like outdoor education and outdoor classroom. But that's something that we're going to talk with your, we have these courtyards. We want to talk to your administration, how you want to utilize them. Do you want students going out there? Don't you want students going out there? How do you want it to be landscaped? Um, what type of level of maintenance do you want? So we'll we'll de we'll design it appropriately. So this is their um, learning commons area. So this is at the end of their academic wing, and um, you know this picture was taken where all the furniture was moved out of the way. But when you go in there now, there is a variety of furniture, whether it's tables and chairs, soft seating. There's an instructional wall. There's a lot of storage uh, components in here as well. You can see there's a, a projector and screen, and then there's also a, a sink. Uh, one of the things you'll also notice in this school, Winding Creek has this as, as well. You can see that all the classrooms, they all have the window that's next to the door, but in addition to that, they have the window into the classroom. 
And this district wanted to implement that because they felt that it created more of a community feel that, you know, you can, everybody can see each other. Um, a lot of districts that I work with, they're always amazed when they walk through, you know, they're like, uh, aren't students distracted? And they go walk through the school and they don't really notice a lot of heads turning to look, seeing people walk down the hallways. Uh, some districts, what they like to do is, you can see over on the right-hand side where that window is, is they want the window sill just a little higher so that you could potentially create a shelter in place underneath of the window. Um, so it's something that we cannot implement at CTE because it's an existing building, but we've talked about maybe doing an NOE, but it comes back to that whole equity thing that if we have one thing at CTE or we don't have something at CTE, then do you want to implement it at the other school? So this is their media center. And if you walk through it now, they use this more as a media center slash steam room. Um, so there was a lot of adaptability that this went through over the years. And this is just right off of the, the main street lot. Any questions on the tours? The only other question I have there is I saw several of like the flooring is curved and, you know, fancy, um, fancy looking flooring, that kind of stuff. Are, are we adding cost by, you know, a circular carpet and, and tiles that, you know, just like you said, they're, they're the lower cost, but when you're looking at them, some of it looks a little fancier than yeah. what we were thinking. One of the things that we like to do with the floor pattern is use the floor pattern for wayfinding for students. Okay. So if you say, you know, you have a color scheme that's two or three colors, and you can say to your students, when you're walking down the hall, stay on the blue. Mm -hmm. When you're walking down the hall, stay on, stay on the yellow. Um, so it just doesn't... So there's little breaks in the floor that's just not all, you know, intersections that you know you might at a um, at where the corridors meets or the corridor meets the lobby. You may do something with the design just to kind of help with that transition. Okay. Um, but that's something again that we'll be talking to the administration about and the comfort level and have them part of the design of that uh, of that floor okay. and it's not just the design but it's also the material right right and you know we've talked about dr perry wasn't a fan of porcelain tile but likes mm -hmm. um lvt and terrazzo and flooring is very easy to do alternates on that we can have a basis of design to make sure we're bringing the project in on budget but then we can do an ad alternate for like a terrazzo to say, okay, if you have extra money in your budget and we get great bids back, could you put terrazzo in high traffic areas in the lobby? Okay. And then if you have maybe even money left over that, maybe can you implement it into the academic works? About wayfinding, um, you know, really stood out from our group that we all said that that's necessary because right now we have campfires on the wall. We have arrows on a floor, right. you know, in colors and things. I mean, so it's just so necessary um, for the designs of the building. It'd yep. be nice to not have, have those. <laughs> right. um, yeah. You know, there's, there's the things that you get, get lost and then yeah. kids get lost, that kind of thing, so. Okay. So for, um, so this is the current CE site plan. Um, you'll see the area in the light blue is the existing, and then the areas with the darker blue are the uh, additions being put onto the school. And the parking and the driveway at the front of the school on the south side of the page, that's mostly going to stay the same. And that is now going to be implemented as the bus drop-off 
and then where you see that one slither of uh, the uh, dark blue addition where the where the buses are queuing, that will be a secondary entrance for bus riders. Uh, that's currently where the Head Start goes in um, into into the school. So then you'll see um, a lot of site construction for a new parking and parent drop-off on the top left-hand corner. You have you have a lot of student riders, a lot of student riders. Um, you do not have enough land to have parents queue in a single aisle bay. So then we're gonna have to double up. So what we implemented is there's actually two driveways where you can double stack cars, but then they're gonna have to merge into one lane and they can be dropped off either at um, the entrance that's gonna be by where the administration is, or they can potentially be dropped off at the kindergarten, uh, gym, cafeteria uh, entrance. Uh, there are, are some parking requirements as far as the um, the count that's needed. That's going to be discussed with the township. Um, one of the other things that we did is we're trying to implement uh, an access drive for uh, deliveries and service trucks. We're also trying to locate a storage facility for your uh, your maintenance department. And one of the other things that we had to do was, if you recall, we're going to keep the geothermal well field, the ground source heat pump HVAC system for the kindergarten, because that is a 50 year investment that you made in 2012. One of the things that we had to do is there was a survey that was done um, to see how deep those wells are, because we we're proposing all this site development for the driveways and for the parking and over top of those well fields. Um, so those those wells, the, he the heads to them are about three to four feet deep. And we're gonna actually um, put, we're actually gonna build up on the site. So we feel that we can build over top of it, which um, made the design for this parking parent drop off a lot easier. That was one of those things we had to do some of the due diligence to make sure that what we're proposing with the design is actually technically feasible to do. All right, one quick question. We, we are all on the same page with the functionality of the gymnasiums that we be able to use them for actual life activities like youth sports parents unlike what we have Correct. currently okay <laughs> just making sure just making sure that we got there so we're with the existing conditions we're kind of tied into the gym at cte on how big it can be it is yeah, yeah. but regardless of what the grade level of the school is we always recommend designing a PIAA regulation basketball and volleyball court in any of your gymnasiums. Uh, what's the seating capacity? I think it's close to 400. So yeah, we're planning for bleachers on one side of the gym with the 400 seat capacity. Okay. Not really much changed with the design, I think, from the last time you saw it, but there's just a little bit more detail that we're getting into. and. You, you can kind of see in, um, on the plan where that open flex space was. Yeah, so right there where the mouse is, that is where we eliminated the two uh, internal classrooms that didn't have any natural daylight. They, so we're going to be discussing with uh, the administration upcoming how this space is uh, needs to be designed, and we're going to develop some renderings and uh, 
Yeah, see how they uh, see what the preference is. Mm -hmm. Plus side, that makes it nice to know that it's not going to be wasted space. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, so I noted that we um, ran an update with the plan for NOE. So this was the previous concept that we did. Um, your the school has four grade levels. So when you have an even amount of grade levels, the obvious thing to do is to go two stories. But because the kindergarten wing is one story, and it's probably not only uh, it's technically infeasible to build on, on top of it, this first pass that we did was a one story option. But what it does is it takes up a lot of site. You know, we were having discussions with the administration on, um, can we have a multi-purpose field that's the size of football field for your youth sports? And where is the playground going? Um, we have to make sure that there is a service drive. We're also looking at a lane for special, special education vans. Um, so even while this site's pretty large, we were taking up a lot of it. Once we added all those elements to it, but also all of the student uh, riders that you have. Um, so we developed an option where a portion of the building is two stories, and we feel that it's going to eliminate some site development, which is going to bring down the site development costs. Now, I had originally showed you just a rough estimate cost. Um, a couple of months ago, but we still need our civil engineer to review that, and they needed to understand the design, the scope of work, their meeting with the municipalities, just for CTE, but for NOE coming up pretty soon, and then they can start to put together a better uh, cost estimate for that. So we feel that this option is going to be more uh, cost effective. So Again, this was that floor plan. One of the things we we looked at was the time it takes from one of those classrooms on the right-hand side to get to the cafeteria. Um, and it's it's some it was somewhat small. So we developed this, we developed this next option where the kindergarten wing is the light blue. The addition is the dark blue. Um, we'll see the uh, parent drop off and the bus drop off in front of the school. Um, the parent drop off is to the right. See all the cars stacking in that aisle way. And then there's the aisle way for the, for the bus riders. And there's this plaza, there's a sidewalk that separates the two. <clears throat> so when the students are being dropped off on that sidewalk, the entrance to the school aligns with that plaza. So then you walk into the school, the kindergarten wing will be somewhat isolated, but again, we'll make sure that there are doors that are on magnetic hold opens, that in the event of an emergency, those can be closed. The administration is to the left of that. Um, and then on the upper right-hand corner are those assembly spaces, and then the academic spaces are on the left. We're able to locate a uh, football field over on the right-hand side. And then we're also looking at adding play area and back of the school adjacent to the cafeteria. This is something uh, with the discussions with the building principal that they felt that the cafeteria and the play area should be adjacent to each other. And when he walked through the school in, at Millersville, they had a similar setup and just was like, yes, this is this is what we need to implement in, into our design. And we also have a kindergarten play area that's just north of the kindergarten wing, and then a service drive that branches off from the parent loop, and then a separate driveway for uh, 
the bands. Um, see where that comment is coming off of off of Berlin. That is the driveway that we're going to need a highway occupancy permit for, which ultimately that timeline will probably drive the schedule for this project because that can be very but we did look at some other options to avoid that but unfortunately that was just something that we could uh we could <clears throat> the noe plan numbers like the 34 or whatever it was might fluctuate as far as the site is concerned yes um do you have the module information from where that quote was or whatever that you could like send over? The $6 million? Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, administration pulled that quote from uh, a state contract um, consortium. So I would have to defer to them to provide that. Do you have that? I have it. Okay, thank you. For, for NOE, what would be the impact of not having all the classrooms in a, a given grade together so as to try to maximize the benefit of the of the two-story plan? Um, I don't know if that's a better question for you or Dr. Perry. Is my question confusing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so ultimate, ultimately, you, you mentioned that we were that that we're looking at alternate alternate plans uh, as opposed to uh, a simple double story building because we're trying to keep all the classrooms of each grade together. Did I understand you correctly? Well, we were locked in. What well, the what's difficult with having in this option the two story. Is that the existing kindergarten way that we're keeping is just a one story way? Um, so the, then the challenge is if we want to limit the amount of site development and go two stories, how do you stack classrooms between three grade levels so that? You don't have one grade level split onto two different groups. So that's kind of the design challenge. Well, and, and ultimately that's that's my question from an academic or logistics standpoint. What is the impact of having one of those three classes. second grade upstairs and three second grade downstairs, for example, to to even it out to uh, you know again maximize. Sure. Since you said last time that yeah. it's definitely the benefit of going two story from um, from a cost perspective. Yep. I'm just wondering. I think operationally, you, know, you limit like some shared resources potentially um, by having half a grade on the bottom floor and another half on on, and it's only gonna it's only gonna impact. Uh, maybe one grade level where the other two grade levels might all be on the same floor. So I think that there's probably some operational inefficiencies by having one of those grade levels that's split between between floors. And Dr. Perry, you may have some other ideas. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, if if I can help though, what I'm seeing here is actually the kindergarten wing, and then we have one with a stack, which would be two, and then a third wing for the first, second, and third grade. So I don't know that we could really pare it down much further, even if we did split a grade in any way, shape, or form. Like the way yeah. the, the, the layout seems to be as compact and efficient as sure. possible yeah. there. Yeah, we didn't we didn't look at having one grade level split. Just because you know, we know that there's going to be some operational inefficiencies, so we didn't we didn't look at that. But if I can like quickly just describe this this the layout. You'll oh see yeah, the, the, sorry. You'll see the you know the kindergarten wing on the bottom right hand corner, and you enter in 
to that lobby that's headed north south on the page. That's the main entrance. And that large pinkish square is the administration area. So that lobby separates the academic spaces on the left and then the assembly spaces on the right. So you have the gym um, in the middle with the stage and then some support spaces above that. And then north of that is the cafeteria with the, caf uh, with the kitchen on the right-hand side by the dock and the service drive. We did locate some of the specials along this lobby. So the music and the art and faculty dining. Um, they're right off of this uh, lobby so that now there's kind of like an equal distance for students to travel to to get the to those uh, to get to those spaces. Um, just above the administration is where the media center is located. So that wing that is headed left right between the media center and the library is kind of an extension of the main street lobby. Uh, but then to the left of that, okay, that's the hard cut of where your academic spaces begin. So those spaces that are located right there is the Head Start, and we have a couple special education classrooms that are right by where the van drop-off is because they felt that the administration felt that that was a good adjacency to cut down on the travel time for certain special education students coming into the building. Then the academic wing that's perpendicular to that on the first floor, that's the first grade, um, along with some of the special education classrooms. And then the academic wing that's on the first floor that's going left to right, that's at the top of the building, that's the second floor, excuse me, the second grade, excuse me. And then on the second floor is the third grade. It's all the third grade. And if you can see that, it's kind of color-coded, the legends over on the left-hand side. But the blue are general classrooms, and the green is the special education. That lavender color is more of like the, the, um, the large academic spaces, like the cafeteria, the community center, and the gymnasium. But did that answer the question? Yes, yes. yes it did. Thank you. With the um, the access to the second floor, yeah, um, through stairs and an elevator, yeah, and it looks like it's fitting within yep. so that those two wings are sure. basically open. Yep. Um, okay. We even developed some massing models that we had shared with the administration mm -hmm. to kind of see like what it look, what it would look like. The other thing that we also like as architects, you know, we want to. We want the public, the communities to see the nice side of the building. The previous design had the dock that was out here yeah, along yes. the road. And that was something that we wanted to try to flip it so that it was on the back end of the building. I, I do like this design a lot better. Um, with the second floor, having those extra, it leaves extra first floor space that you might lend to those open air rooms that we were just yep. looking at for the, yep. if not the still. Yeah, we think so as well. So the last thing we had to review was just some of the next steps. So these are some of the milestones that we're gonna um, that we're gonna be doing over the next month. So as I mentioned the civil engineering uh, K and W is going to continue to meet with the municipalities. You know, we feel really comfortable with the site design. It's the schematic level, and now they go to the municipality and they'll have a meeting with their engineer and any administrators um, from the municipality that want to be part of that discussion and to show them the sketch plan talk about uh, some of the different zoning requirements and the land development process. Uh, and then we'll come back to us and they'll share, okay, based upon the feedback that we got, this is how long that this is gonna take 
to get through this approval process for both of the projects. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned that we were trying to shoot for the end of this year to put CTE out the bid and then sometime next spring for NOE, but it's all really going to come down to the uh, municipal time frame, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do the projects within what we uh, what we think it should take to design the building. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to expand our design professional team, and at some point, we'll bring a uh, proposal for a food service consultant. And then the last thing is um, we had a, what we call a visual listening exercise at CTE with faculty and students. We're gonna do that next week, next week with NOE faculty and students. My next board update, I'll show you what that um, exercise looks like. But what we'll do is just real quickly, we put up a bunch of photos, you know, similar to the ones that we showed you of, of those tours that we went through, uh, of different spaces in elementary schools. Uh, most of them are is work that we've done. Some of the other photos that we use is, is published work that's out there from other architects from across the country. So we asked the students, uh, district will select, you know, half a dozen to a dozen students. We'll give the students green stickers and red stickers. And we'll ask them, go look at these photos. If there's something that you see that you like, and it could be anything from the materials, the uh, patterns, colors, the furniture, the design of the space. Put a sticker on something that you like, or something that you don't like. You could potentially like something in one photo, but maybe there's something else in that photo that you that you dislike. Then we talk about it. And it's very engaging. I'm always amazed that faculty, um, after the students go, they're always so surprised with how insightful their students are, no matter what the age is. Um, then what we'll do is we'll dismiss the students and then we take the faculty through the same exercise. One of the things though that we'll ask them, it's a little bit different, is we ask the faculty to talk about how you see grouping your learners together based upon these photos, along with some of the aesthetics and design elements. Then what we'll do is with the information that we're getting from the building users, where, where are they different and where are they similar? And then we want to try to implement some of that feedback in the design. And then we'll do some type of recap with the administration. So we already did that with, um, with CTE, and then we're going to do it with NOE next week. And then we'll, we'll kind of show you some of the um, some of the comments that they had at the next week. Having been a part of that, I want to thank you, Anthony, for taking the lead on that with our CTE family. It was a beautiful, beautiful interaction with the kids. And they are, they're super insightful and they like things when they're new, they're asked to. There's a lot of green, a lot of red, and then, you know, just the explanations that they provided. And um, I had the opportunity to bear witness to this, you know, as they were going through, you know, through this, Dr. Sterner and me. Um, and it is interesting to yeah. see but what I appreciated is it was the cultural aspect of a facility, of how you feel with, within your space. There's that. That was very, very important to the students is they like these particular colors because it made them happy. It made them feel engaged with what they were learning. Um, they really liked yellow and green, you yeah. know, were, were the standout colors. Um, but also the, the instruction space, is, you know, that there was a lot of talk about soft seating, which we don't have a lot of, you know, in our schools. So it's kind of giving us that opportunity to consider that. How can we incorporate that in the media center, et cetera, and perhaps even in, to some degree, some of our classrooms. So um, it was interesting. It was a really, really interesting, but they were fully engaged um, for a while. Yeah. Um, but he did a great job with everybody. So yeah, the, the interesting, we always ask 
um, the administration, you know, be very careful with who you're selecting to be part of this exercise. <laughs> that obviously with the students, you want those students that are not afraid to voice their opinion and talk in front of their peers. And the faculty thought that they picked, you know, they picked so many boys and they picked so many girls. It's like, all right, we feel that these kids, they're going to get up there and they're going to talk. But then when the bright lights were shining, <laughs> the boys didn't say anything. Uh -uh. And there were certain, the girls just took over the conversation <laughs> and were leading the way. And it just took some, yeah. you know, it took a little bit of pushing the boys like, all right, guys, come on. Like, you got to give some feedback. And they eventually did. They did. But it was, I, the faculty was very amused by that. that so, was yeah. Funny. So I think that's that's it. Any other any other questions? All right. Well, well thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you tomorrow, Dr. Perry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and we will move on to the finance portion of the agenda. I am going to start with uh, finance item number five, which is a presentation on the proposed final general budget. And Mrs. Duncan, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I'll take a breath here. All right. <laughs> so, oh, on to the next item. Okay, so we've been meeting frequently to uh, Prepare the budget and to talk a lot about the different items. So this is just the agenda. I can sell here. The agenda or the this? No, I have this one. I don't have the agenda. I'm sorry. So the agenda was sent electronically. Right. We don't have a hard general. So we've been working on um, coming up with a final budget. So what you'll see tonight is information that we already have talked about. This is just putting it all together into one presentation. So we we'll start out with what we always plan to do is we want to make sure that our budget is taking into account our mission, our vision. So as you can see, our vision is to empower our students. So as you see, we'll go through uh, the, the direction that the district is going is to always have our students in the forefront and to make sure that they're receiving everything that we feel that helps them to become Again, confident, confident, and creative builders of the future. So our first slide is the enrollment in the different buildings. So in our K to six, as you see, this is what we currently have: um, nineteen hundred students. We have three buildings. There's three principals, one assistant principal, and two deans. Um, our middle school is seven to eight. We have about 575 students. It's one building, one principal, and one assistant principal. High school, again, is 9 to 12. 1,231 students, one building, two principals, and two assistant principals. And it's one building, but it's actually the high school building and the CCTC. So that's why you're seeing two principals. So we have enrollment in the building as a total of 3706, or the Enrollment in the building is 3706. So you also see it says total 4015, 4015. So the reason for that is not all our students are housed here in our district. So we have a lot of uh, students who are in special ed or different different areas. So they're housed outside of the district. So this 3706 is in our buildings at this point. So I just want to clarify why you see two different numbers. 
This is a graph. It's going to be a little bit hard for some people to see, but basically what it's doing is it's listing each of the buildings, taking the enrollment and just showing you what it looks like. So the first one is Conewago, to the far left is Conewago Elementary. Then we have Conewago Valley Intermediate. And then we have NOE and then the middle school. And then of course the high school is the far right. And then there is a, see there's a red dot. That dot is telling you how many special ed students. That's showing you in our enrollment in those buildings, what level our special education students are just to, because that's a real driving force for our cost and our process. And some of the things that we have to keep in mind as we're working on the budget are our mand mandated costs. We have a lot of mandated costs. There's very little that we can truly affect. So we have salaries that are contracted, our healthcare pieces, charter school, special education, transportation, utilities, debt, legal, and safety items. So I just wanted to remind everyone of the different things that we're dealing with um, when we're operating as a district. So I'm gonna start with the revenues. So I wanted to just go over the revenues uh, by function, just to explain a little bit of what we're looking at. So our revenues are broken out by the 6,000s area. It's just the account number. That is local uh, funding. Our 7,000s is state, it's called, considered the PA state subsidy. So revenues that come from our state. The 8,000s is the federal government. So it would be our title programs, our federal programs, and so forth. And then 9,000s is if we're doing uh, transfers. So this is a budget by budget comparison of our local state and federal looking at last year compared to this year. So that's just a, a running, showing you a breakdown of those numbers. So I think what's always easier to see instead of just looking at numbers, you'll see that as we go through, there's a lot of graphs. I think it's just easier to see a picture. So this is a picture of exactly what we just talked about, the, the local, the state, and the federal revenues. And you can see it's um, several years going through the 24 budget, 25. So it shows you uh, each of the uh, funding areas. And as you can see, the, the green, which was the federal funding, that you can see where it started to really increase and now it's starting to decrease. That was because of COVID funds and all the COVID activity that happened. Those funds are starting to dissipate and go away. So those were one-time fundings that will no longer exist. So that's why the federal block coming in here. Yes, yes. Before you move off then, Mrs. Nugget, so I see that within the state, it actually, in this graph, we're showing that it's decreased, and that's a conservative estimate as far as uh, what the state will provide because that's not uh, finalized yet. Correct. Um, there's a couple reasons why that dropped, and right now we're holding the state funding um, stable because we one there isn't a budget, and two we've been told that although there's been different numbers flying around to just plan on. Um, flat funding. The reason you're seeing a decrease is we had some PCD grants, which are actually are state grants, which will no longer have those PCCD grants. Um, as new ones come along, we may be able to obtain them, but the funding that we had for the past, those have are expiring. So that's why you're seeing it. I think it's maybe $50,000. And again, this is just another uh, demonstration of our revenues. So you can see, again, our local source is blue, then the state is the orange, and federal is the green. Um, and of course, the state is supposed to be providing us with a 50% funding. So this just shows you how they're not following through with what they said they would do. That's not shocking at all. Um, from 
2020, so the proposed 2025, it's an $11 million jump just in the blue area. Mm -hmm. Is that the same type of jump from like 2015 to 2020? Um, I would have to go back and look, but I would say that it probably is as it's increasing. Uh, that's increasing with all of our, you're looking at the local. Yeah. And it's also increases as there's growth in the community. So we can also see that growth is happening in the community. So the, a large amount of growth is happening. Housing, industry in this area in the last five so some of that is potentially like business revenue too not yeah. just individual yes this is business and um local i mean it's business and residential so this also includes items such as um, in the local revenues it's also items such as uh, we'll get back to the detail actually we're going to move on to the detail i'll show you the detail okay <laughs> you're, i'll stand you're on them no no you're jumping ahead of me <laughs> your, your questions are good thank you one million is that supposed to be including a tax increase or yes what? yes that includes everything okay but we don't know what that price would be without the tax increase no, because um, when we met in our other meetings, we agreed to move forward with the amounts, so it's included in the total budget. In the prior meetings, as we went through all the revenues, um, we came to, there seemed to be a consensus on the amount, so I included all of that so you can see what that package looks like. So the amounts. I thought we only agreed that we wouldn't raise it up higher than the index. The index. index. That's correct. I and mean, that is what that it is not exceeding the index. So is the index a guaranteed thing every year? Um the index changes and it has gone up some years. It's based on there's a lot of calculations and the state provides us with what the index is. There's always a base index and then there's an adjustment <laughs> index based on your um your market value in your area. So if you have a uh, high, if you're different calculations, depending on what it is, you will have an additional adjustment to your base. So if the base, just say the base is 5.05%, then depending on your economic values in your area, it could end up being 6%, 6.0 depending. So do we have to do that every year? Do we have to do the five? Well, the index, the, the base index. We have to like raise taxes by that every so those, year? Yeah, those were the discussions that we had in January, February as we were building the budget and we looked at all of the factors to that. So the, the index itself is the maximum. Right? So we had the discussion, here's what it looks like, here's the need, where do we go? And that's what is reflected here is the guidance that we approved uh, to, to put the package together, right? Uh, for for, for like this, this year, yeah, I yeah, remember that yeah. portion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting, but I didn't I'm think not that you guys evil eyes, just to clarify. Um, I know that we did that like for this, you know, last year, this year, collectively, the sports did that. Do we have like, do we have to hit the no. index every year? Well, is that a guaranteed thing? Each year is individual. So each year you evaluate the situation and then determine what you need to do to balance your budget. But each year is, is based on its own merit. So there could be years when the index is lower or it could be uh, lower than the percentage that we had this year. So what we do in December, I guess we did in December, is we elected to not go above the index. So if we would go above the index, we could file for what is considered exceptions. So we decided that we would not do that, keeping our taxpayers in mind. So we did not file to go, to, we did not, filing our resolution to not go above the index then prevents us from going beyond and filing for exceptions. There are exceptions for um, uh, well, there's exceptions special for place. special education, which uh, we would qualify for. There's a PCERS exception. There's a, some other exceptions, but we said we would not do that. But are we required? 
are we required to hit the index? Like, can we just not raise taxes at some point? If that, we can afford it. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's the key. And that's why we all agreed to do it to the full extent this time, because we're working. Lori gave us that package that we may be able to put some of this into the savings account, you know, what we consider the savings account, so that hopefully in the future, we're setting ourselves or future boards up to protect our taxpayers to the best of our ability. Yeah, okay. that's correct. It's not a savings account. It's, it's, it's yeah. set aside for what for major. I was just simplifying that the, That's yeah. why I quoted yeah. like for us, it's what we consider we're putting in savings accounts so that you know when the heater blows up, we have the money to put towards it. But it Lori just kind of gave us that um like you said, the the putting it back to prepare. For budgeting for that construction. Yeah. Yes. Right. Construction yes. the ACT. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh -huh. for example, last year we did go to the index, but the year before that, I think it was, or two years before that, we did not. Mm -hmm. So that it, it, you take a look at where the district is and what the needs are. Uh, and quite honestly, um, when COVID hit, one of the considerations was the impact on COVID and industry. And we made a conscious decision that we were not going to go to the full extent of the index that the different year. So it is something that we as a board you know, review and, and take a look at. Just because you can, there's an index number doesn't mean that you have to it. Well, I remember that we voted that we would not go above the index, but I don't remember when or if we ever voted for a tax increase. And that's all part of, I think it was January, February, where the, the and we'll get to this, where Lori outlines the uh, the impact for $100,000. Well, we understand that. That's $112 and I'm convinced. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember as a board ever voting. You didn't vote yet. Okay, well, so that was process. my clarification. So you need to wait for the process. We're going through the process. So the process is we met, we talked, we discussed. So that's the process. Yes. So there will be a vote. So how it works is this is the presentation to the public. The next step is a vote next week at the, the board meeting. It's for the proposed final budget. Then Whatever determines to happen at that point in time, then it lays open for 20 days, and then there's a final budget, then there's a final vote in May. So there's two votes, and that's the process. So we're still, you haven't gotten to your vote. So we're still in the presentation and presenting the information process. But the only information we're giving, giving here is on a tax increase. Correct. So we've had, that was the direction that we gave her was to right. go to the right. index, which would indicate a tax increase. So other information we're getting was, you know, this, which breaks out by cost and budget, what was um, provided as well as the staffing plan that we looked at. Um, well, I also had specifically asked the other month, if we do not pass a tax increase, what are we willing to give up? And all I was told was, well, the budget has to be prepared or accepted. Or we don't know. No, I'm sorry. We don't know how much we're going to get from the federal government. But that didn't answer the question originally. It is if we do not do a, a tax increase, which I know a lot of people in the community do not want, you know, where, where does that leave us as a board? In making cutbacks, right? So that's that's part of the discussion where the guidance that we gave to Mrs. Duncan, which is so we have you know the breakout again of the costs and the staffing plans. So some of that, right, is so we did make adjustments to the staffing plan to reduce costs uh, from a line item standpoint. Here, this was pretty much a net zero uh, from. Uh, the input from the budget in the area. So we really would be looking at, at costs. Uh, if that's of interest, then that's a discussion that we need to have rather quickly. Okay. When are the teacher contracts supposed to be 
like those numbers are supposed to be finalized in order to take that into account for this. So we're in the last year of the the, the current contract, so there will be negotiations uh, starting the latter part of this year. So that doesn't even play into this budget. It's not. It's not. the end of the previous That's contract correct. that plays. Okay. Okay, um, six, okay, so just to show you that that local revenue includes um, our investments, um, other taxes, earned income tax, such taxes. And then seven thousand is our state revenue fund. Um, and as you can see, it's physical subsidies, special education, transportation. Um, piece of reimbursement and some other items. So that's the detail of the state revenue. What's planned on? Plan on is um, some of our bonds were when the state used to provide bonding and financing for bonds, that was reimbursement that we received for those bonds. Um, the state no longer provides that type of funding to us, yes. but these bonds still exist, so they're grandfathered in. And those are funds that we're going to receive until those bonds are paid off. Um, Possibly. Well, most of them were probably 20 year bonds, so I would say that they'll probably. Say, 2035. But in the meantime, if the interest rates really drop, we would then look at refinancing those bonds for a better savings. Mm -hmm. So there's other considerations too. So we should be getting more money in for the next decade. Okay. You would receive probably that level. I don't think you would receive something higher because the the funding no longer exists, or anything new that we do won't be funded that way. Mm -hmm. Unless the state was, they put a moratorium on planning bonds and financing, unless they change their using the plan con construction process. Federal revenue, again, is just our title programs. There's access money and a little bit of the ESSERS is remaining um, COVID money, so to speak. So that would be the last of it. Um, this will be the last budget that you'll see that funding. And those are things that we've been accounting for. And the issue that occurs from something like that is it's one-time funding, but then funds are supposed to be used for certain items. And if you end up some of the things that uh, the money required us to spend it on is for additional mental health issues and staffing, counseling, and that. that when the funding goes away, you're left having to find a way to support it. So that becomes a real issue for us. So we've been working to back our way out of reliance on that funding. We still have the cost, but now we don't have the funding. So those are the things Like sometimes people think grants and money is great. It is, but it depends on the strings attached to it. So mm -hmm. now it has left us with things that we have to continue to pay for, but they pay the funding. The after expansion of 2024. So moving on to the expenses. And again, just to review, the first couple of slides we'll look at will be um, looking at the expense function. So again, the functions, taking the expenses, breaking them out by function is breaking them out and looking at them by their functions area for such as um, regular ed, special ed, the 2000s are the support services, transportation, things like that that support students. Um, the 3000s are student activities and then the 5,000s are financing, like our bond payments and so forth. Okay, so this is our expenses by function, and you can see that we have the instruction area, support services, our operations, and then our financing. Okay, 
So the next way we'll look at and break down the expenses is by object. So that's looking at it by expense area, like what type of expense is it, such as, so there's a function area, so we would have regular ed salaries. So it's uh, just another descriptive way to look at the expenses. This is salaries, benefits, all those types of expenditures. All right, so this is our expenses, expenditures by object. So you can see our salaries, benefits, uh, purchase services, right? supplies, property, uh, finance, and all of those types of things. Um, and you'll see that when you look at our purchase services, you can see where that is reduced this year. Um, the main reason for that reduction is because we took on those salaries, pulling back the autistic classes that we talked about. So this is just a shift in where our expenses are located. So that's why you also see that the salaries are higher too, is because we're now, instead of paying the LIU for these classes, we're paying it through payroll. That's just uh, some of the changes that we had talked about before. And again, Interesting to note that the, the salaries went up by about 800,000, but the benefits went up by 1.6 million. Well, the benefits went up um, due to a uh, huge change in our um, health, health insurance, um, our PCERS, all of those types of, yeah. of things. And um, our transportation went up too. So when you look at the um, other purchase services, our transportation really went up too. So again, this is just another way of looking at it, um, putting the numbers into a picture. Expenses by object shows you what uh, our expenses look like each year. And I think this graph actually shows it a little bit better. When you look at our salaries and benefits, the blue and the orange are the largest because we're a personnel-driven type of industry. We have our biggest costs are our teaching staff and our staff. And that's what is providing all the services to our students. So when you look at salaries and benefits, um, it's a total of 68.5% of our total budget. These are some of the positions that we had talked about. Um, Dr. Perry in the past has given explanations of why we need the different positions. Um, a lot of those positions you're seeing are take backs, take back of autistic classes were already technically paying for these classes just in a different way, we're paying for them through the IU. So there are positions that now um, the teachers and the A's in those classrooms would come back into the district to be a staff member of ours. So the, a lot of the classes that you're seeing were due to the, a lot of positions are due to the take back of those classes. Um, this is just a little bit of state information for you. Um, our spending per student is $15,563 per student. The state average is $18,383 per student. So we're actually spending $2,820 less per student than the state average. <laughs> so you can see we're ranked 425 out of 500 districts. So we're way at the bottom of spending compared to bottom of districts. So I think it's important to, to look at that to realize that we are very conservative in how we're moving forward. Um, we're ranked at the bottom of 25% in spending in the state. Yeah, and dropping that. Last year we were at 425, yeah. and now we're at 428. Yeah. And also countered by to go back to the forecast. So if we use the, this year's current numbers of students back in 2020 when we did the forecast of growth for the, the for district, the forecast number was 300 to 3,872 we expect. And we also know that it should get four or five years out 
the numbers become a little you know, less reliable. Uh, but that's 143 more students being at 4,015. There's 143 more students than what was projected. So we're seeing, you know, that growth that uh, we had been projecting, you know, going back to 2020, it's being realized. And that also then is impacting, you know, our expenses. We're seeing you know, this, the special education programs, the enrollment going up. And, and you know, that's why we have to add you know, positions and build. So I think it's a, we may be on the lower end for the entire state. But yesterday I looked up the area schools. We're relatively in the same area as the the other area schools with that price per student. Um, but it appears that like the teacher salary here is kind of substantially higher than all the other schools in the area. If I'm right. That's a great meeting because our next slide is going to show how we compare to you. Yes. Thanks for <laughs> serving that software. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got you. Yes. So um, the next graph showing our line spending and it's looking at districts in the area and it's also looking at uh, spending in uh, some York County schools, but also looking at the schools in Adams County and you can, as you can see, we're uh, next to the bottom in spending with our 15563 with uh, the top being Gettysburg at $19,769. And this information is all right from, um, from, the, from the AFR information. It's an annual financial report that are submitted by every district into the state. So that's where this data comes from. So then this also brings me to give you just a little picture of our state funded. So um, to be fully funded by the state, we would receive uh, $7 million in funding. So that includes basic ed, uh, special ed, all those types of items. Our current funding by the state is $22.5 million. So our shortfall by the state is $7.5 million a year. Um, that's basically $1,794 per student shortfall. Um, we currently receive uh, I mean, $5,632 per student. The state average is $7,426, thus giving us the $1,794 shortfall by the state. And then another area that has a large impact on the district is charter schools. I just want to give you some numbers to uh, look at. So currently for a regular uh, ed charter school student, we pay $11,973. Um, and then when you look at special ed student, or that attends a charter school, we're paying $32,188. So I just wanted to show you those numbers to see the large impact that it does have on our district. The, the importance of charter school reform. So the, our cost for doing uh, regular students is roughly half of that 11,000 number. Uh, and the cost for the special education, uh, it's almost now coming up to three three times. I mean, it was, it's it's roughly, I think, 13,000 for us, and now we're up to 32. I think at some point, we may have talked about it before, but like really delving into this, and I know a lot of the charter school reform is more of a state level thing. Mm -hmm. However, there was a time when like I didn't know the programs for my daughter that New Oxford had. To the point where she was going to get her GED because we were done with the, what they sh the charter schools had done. Um, so I think maybe we should like circle back and talk about that in a future agenda, which is making sure that those you know 224 people know definitely know about the other programs because we, personally we tried different charter schools and the support that they give the students is non-existent. 
um, and it really messes them up. But you know, as a parent at the time, and you know, it was a different administration. Let's clear clear that up. Um, I felt like I just had no choice, like because things weren't so great. Mm -hmm. So if we can fix that and let them know that we've got so many more options that they don't know than having less than that's where I come up with you know what I mean mm -hmm. support from from right. the money grab and that's how I how I personally see it probably shouldn't say that out publicly no. but that's just how it is they have a they have a program we initiated a couple of years ago that they, they reach out they have a volunteer for the black folks yeah, we contact every family every year um, to talk to them about what we offer, um, to try to understand their needs a little bit differently as well, because they may have needs that we can't necessarily address. You know, so it just is a reach out program. And we have been successful in bringing students back to us. Coming out of COVID has certainly helped that as well. You know, a lot of families have shared there was just fear and, you know, going into a public school in the middle of the pandemic was very scary for them. Um, but, you know, seeing what that's like on the other side, trying to be home and trying to educate your kids and, and manage that education, they were realizing, you know, the kids were doing great here with us. And then that bring a lot of our students back. But that is something that we work with, you know, the administrative team annually on. It's always on our agenda, so we always talk about it. We're aware of it. We track the numbers, and they do have and flow, though I will say that. You know, so for as many as we bring back, and we're celebrating, it feels like another, you know. So we just have to stay on top of it. I think that's you know, that's message you get to those people. So we also have that as a. I'm sorry, and it's not and um. You had mentioned that before in this group about um, having a, a deeper dive. So I had that plan maybe over the summer to take a, a deeper dive into what, what that looks like, just so our community is very spot. Awesome. Thank you. Sometimes I can't remember what I do say and what I yeah. do. I know yeah. we're all shocked. Planning that in the summer, maybe July ish. So the next graph that we have again is just showing the charter school increases. Um, intuition that we've been paying. See, and this is for special education, so you can see where how it's grown over the years. So this graph is to show you when looking at some of the local or not local, but the, the state charter schools that are PA and some of the other common charter schools. When you look at um, their cost per student for the information that they submit. So this is the spending that they provide to each student. They're saying, this is what it costs us to educate a student. So they're charging us $32,188. And as you can see, um, what their costs are to educate special education student, their average is $10,976. So keeping in mind that they are not the brick and mortar buildings are the brick and mortar charters. Yes, they have buildings to maintain, but a lot of the cyber schools, they're not maintaining buildings, things that we are maintaining, but we're paying $32,188 for a special education student. Um, and this is showing what their costs are. So it's, it's quite a difference. This is just a historical view of our revenues and expenditures and general fund balance with our the green line being our fund balance. Um, it has grown a little bit. It's pretty well stable. Basically, we have about 1% of our budget in our savings. So when you think about what our payrolls are on monthly, that may be with support us for three months. So that's just something to keep in mind. Our fund balance isn't huge, so we're not sitting on a huge amount of, of funds. But also that fund balance helps you <clears throat> obtain bond ratings, things like that. So right, right. That's why we shouldn't. Right, when your fund balance is low, you're, <clears throat> you're being 
evaluated by Moody's, it affects your bond rating. So the lower your rating, the higher or the the more money you're going to pay to borrow. So the better your rating, of course, is. Uh, it's just like a credit score. credit score and interest right. rates, essentially. Correct. So the better our rating, the better interest rates that we can obtain. Or you take from that. Yeah, when you like start pulling money from the fund balance, it starts to show uh, instability in the district, and it shows that you're uh, having there's financial, financial underlying financial issues in the district. So that's why we try really hard not to pull any money from the fund balance if you don't have to. This is just a summary of the revenues and expenditures. So we what the revenues are, expenditures, totals. And this is a, the information that we had from uh, several of the meetings, looking at the millage rate, the increase in what is the impact on the taxpayer. And again, the, there hasn't been a vote. The vote would be in the next board meeting. Um, this is just the information showing our fund balance, what our capital fund balance is. So our general fund balance, we have two portions to it. We have an, an assigned portion where we assign the money for certain things that if they would come we would have money available to pay if there's something unforeseen. Uh, the capital reserves is where we store funds to when they, uh, in the past, when people have questioned that we are not repairing our buildings or we're not spending money on maintenance items, we're pulling that money from the capital reserves. So those are funds that we use to uh, replace water heaters, uh, or replace black things like that, that come up structurally. That money can has to be spent on, uh, there's guidelines, so it has to be spent on like an asset type of item. And how do we continue funding that? The capital reserve fund, where does that money come from? That money comes from when we have our budget and if we end up, so we have a budget and all along we still continue to watch, even though we uh, asked the budget, we have allocated monies for certain items. We continue to be mindful of what we're spending and if there is any excess or if we would happen to receive more state funding, um, something of that nature, we have additional funds. What we do with that is then we put it into our capital reserve to help fund any types of projects that come along with pairs of the building. Um, we have a coming up a roof at the uh, athletic wing that needs replaced. It's those types of things that we utilize those funds to cover uh, those costs when they come up because they're um, buildings this size, costs aren't just Ten thousand dollars. We're looking at a roof that's two hundred and seven thousand dollars. So, um, when we have excess funds, that's the plan is to put it into that uh, holding account in order to pay for those items when they come up. When we are when we have a roof issue or when something breaks down, boiler, those types of things. So, on one hand, I see how. Like when you need a new roof, then that means, okay, yeah, we need a new roof, but it's okay. We're not going to have to raise taxes because of the roof, because we have this sitting here. But on the other hand, like there's families here that don't have savings themselves. And if, I know we don't know what we're getting from the state, so we kind of raise the taxes to compensate for that. But then if we get a chunk from the state, we don't like be like, oh, hey, we got a refund. So here's your refund. You know what yeah. I mean? It, it doesn't so how do we balance that? Like instead of hitting the five in the index. Then next we time we like might three? not have to raise at all. At all. Right. Or we maybe just do a quarter of the index or a half instead of doing the full index. So we do have we do have layers of options where, you know, if this year we're, we've been told that we might get more from the state but we can't bank on it until it's actually in our pocket. So at this point in time, we're going with what we had last year 
And in order to get where we need to, we're going to the index this year. However, if the state happens to come back or if we can find some savings in some of the things that we expected to cost this much, but only cost this much, and we're able to you know, see that we did better than our expected budget this year, the next year might look completely different when we decide um, on what to do with that index. We can go from not raising anything to just incrementally, you know, getting to that number. Each year is an individual review, so each right. year it may be different. And we also discussed in the earlier meetings uh, the impact of the ACTI and what that's going to look like. We also discussed the impact of the construction renovation. So, um, a large part of what we were doing is to to be covering those expenses that are coming along. So we're trying to, instead of all of a sudden our bond payment increases by a million dollars, and then you know how do we pay for that? We're taking it in increments to be able to afford to pay for that when it does come into play. I, I think what you said earlier with um, the index plus exceptions, we're raising this year to the index to avoid exceptions when ACTI comes to fruition, when our bonds start coming due, you know, we're preparing for what we know is coming without having to ask for it all at once. And I think reiterating that at the meetings is really helpful because yeah. And how many times do we hear from the government? Well, we're doing this now, so we don't do it later. And then it's like, aha, mm -hmm. JK, this is what's happening. Um, you know, and so we talk about not being able to, um, or making sure we save here and there. But then, you know, I, I do, I struggle with that a lot, as we know. Yeah. And maybe I'm the only one sitting here that's struggling with it. I don't mm -hmm. think I am. Um, but like, when I look at the 112.80 for the, the millage, which, I'm still trying to understand the concept of that at all, but right. you know, um, I thought it was like individually and now I'm seeing it's for $100,000. So that kind of super sucks. Like that's it, rough. Yes, it, it and it's gonna be rougher for some people, but again, one of the things that we're looking at here and I and I know that, you know, this is really, you're, you're sitting in, in her seat as well. It's really difficult. And the first couple of years it was for me too. Um, and I'm not saying it's it's necessarily easy for me to say, hey, we're, we're going to raise taxes, but I can see the validity and the necessity of going to the full index this year, because in two to three years, we would have to be looking at exceptions without the state coming. Through. And I think we all can sit here and understand that the state's not coming through. You know, that's and but if they do, then great news. Next year's budget looks like a completely different animal. And, you know, so then I work in health insurance. One of the things that we have to do is make sure that we're in compliance with paper. In order to do that, we always err on the side of a member surprise is going to be good news. So if you are going to the doctor and you could potentially get a zero dollar bill or a $50 bill, we are giving you the understanding that you're likely gonna get the $50 bill. Then when you don't get charged, it's a pleasant surprise instead of what you're gonna come up with dollars. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here is to ease into it so that we don't have to come up with that $50, $500,000, you know, um, but out of thin air. Well, we're not voting on this like tonight, it's next meeting, right? right. Mm -hmm. Like is there, any have we have we hundred percent looked over every single penny to like do as bare minimum as we can possibly do like one more goodwill check between now and then is that something that's possible or have we done that? So when we have the vote um, next week and the, the budget is laid open for the twenty days, um, it can't increase. But if we find out information as we go along, it can increase. Or decrease, sorry. So um, we're constantly reviewing and looking at information as we go along. So, and um, to go back to the 112.80, that's $9.40 a month. So that one, okay. divided by 12 months. Okay. 
just and, and in this area, um, most of the houses are going to be in the 200,000 or less market. So you're looking at twice that at the most, you know, per year, $18 a month, less than, less than $20 a month. Um, which for some people that's, that's the top of their budget. I, you know, we understand that, but we're not looking at 40 or 50 or $80 a month because we're planning, you know, ahead and hoping that we don't have to increase next time. Well, hopefully like this very recorded conversation, yeah. <laughs> you know, in a year or two years, you know, what it comes back to come this, back. they can come back and be like, okay, look, remember, like, yeah, we may have had to raise it at this point. But we didn't go as high as we could, yes. and look, we're not going to raise it this year. You know, like let's. Yeah. And I think, and I think everybody think, sitting here has that same mindset. Like I've, you know, I've talked to you, and I think we've we've shared before that there were boards that sat here year after year, going, "Oh well, you know, we're we're within the budget. We're not going to raise it at all because you know, let the future boards worry about where they're going to come up with and money for stuff." And there were some prices that put right. us in the why we should be or right. could be doing even the if, exception, right? Even if they would have just done a tiny bit each of those years, we would have been in a more comfortable position. We wouldn't have had three years of argument in order you know, to accommodate what we need for the elementary schools, things like that. So this is this is Lori giving us everything that she possibly can to help us make the right decision for the next 10 to 15 years instead of the next two or three that we're sitting in. Yeah, and we met with the finance. It's like that, that very first month when I looked at it. And I mean, she was just an open book. Like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. No defense, no no attitude. Yeah, she um, does she's sweet as a button. And so, you know, it's like, hey, sorry, I have to ask about every little penny, but I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, so, like on one hand, yeah, I know, like we've right. done everything, but it's still like, that's what. Sorry, we. So. And there are resources for older people in our community to go get tax right. property tax right, right. the information that you requested about the renters rebate and the taxpayers rebate there are um, programs that they can file for if their income is low they can file to the state it doesn't run through our district but through the state they can receive um relief relief, relief. And, yeah and we have links to that on the website to help okay. It's just that the you go to Warren Eckert's office and they'll help you fill paperwork out. And there's different yeah. well, things. And if there's a school we can't get the funding we need from the state, then I'm glad to disseminate the website or the link. Right. You yeah. know, so maybe they can go the from the state. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. get, get it from them one way or the other. Yeah. Um, but no, I, it, it's, I sat there. I, I was the same way the first couple of years. I'm like, um, are, are we sure? And, but I'll tell you, you know, these guys have, um, even Sharon had said, like each of the principals were able to keep their budget and, and not increase it this year, you know. So it's unfortunately the, the piecers, oh my gosh. Well, like that's the, why I said where I said yeah. 1.6 million in benefits and most of that's piecers. Yeah. So it's, yeah, know, it's a lot of we money. all, as citizens of Pennsylvania, should be in an uproar at our. Legislation in Harrisburg. Yes. Because that would make a difference in mill age rate. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, would I say, I, I'm not naive enough to think that we couldn't go through this line item by line item and find a couple hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars there, but that's not going to make any difference. Major yeah. difference. Pieces cost a heck of a difference, right? That the charter so schools so couple of that on the agenda then. So yeah. just fire me up about that, that so I can go. <laughs> Yeah, up there and uh, have some more. I think in conclusion, I really would, I would like you all to know in our community to know is that our budgeting is a year long process. I mean, as we're starting one, we're finishing with this year's budget and we're taking a look at the trends. We're also looking not just next year, we're looking two, three, four, five, ten. We're visioning 20 years in the future, of course, not having a crystal ball. But the goal of the board is to build a sustainable future for our community that isn't burdensome. And we know it's tough times. We're in really lean, tough times right now, and it will be. And we've been very transparent about that. That, you know, we're we're trying to um, 
deal with our aging facilities. We're trying to deal with our staffing, um, you know, which was uh, a five-year plan, seven-year plan, eight-year plan. Um, we have a lot of challenges in front of us, and it's just it, we need to stay the course, and we're growing, as Mr. Kitchen. So when you have all of those variables going on in ACTI and a lot of uncertainty about when that's going to happen, we can project costs. We know they're going to be in the millions. Um, you know, probably 60, 65 million, it could be a potential number. And that's the number that we've been working through as we consider what that might look like. Um, but, you know, and our administrative team and our curriculum leaders and our teachers that I'm on the inside and I hear how our people talk, that, you know, they're very highly conscious of spending money and not spending money. We are the colonial family. We are working together to try to reduce those costs. Um, and I, it's important to me to reassure each of you and our community, if you talk to our teachers, you will always hear them talking about reducing costs and being aware of the costs. Um, they're keenly aware. They find money on their own to make sure that they're able to provide opportunities. And of course, you know, we'd be completely remiss to not mention our partners that help to support us. So our PTOs, our community partners, our industry partners that we do hold together, you know, to provide the very best education that we can uh, for our children. And I couldn't be any more proud of that. Uh, this is unique. This is a really unique experience that we're experiencing. Um, but I do believe if we stay the course, we're going to get over that hump, and you know, hopefully, the state will fulfill you know their promises and um, you know the the impacts of the lawsuits and if the court cases are going to come to fruition, which will be this not even a blip on our radar in the future. So that's our goal, you know. Um, not to shortchange anybody's opinions, but I do have that privilege to be able to hear each you know, person in our community's perspective. And it matters and it gets thrown into that tumbler as, as we present a budget for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your time and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making it understandable. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> Good job with that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And let's uh, continue on with the discussion of the finance items. We've got items one through six on the agenda. And I'll open the floor for, for questions on those items. Number four. Who is the final kind of say on what the uniforms look like for our marching band and specifically our river? <laughs> Had to be asked. So, I am not thinking they are necessarily a part of. No, I don't think it's this. Color guard's not approved. Not this. Uh, uh -huh. Well, I would still like to know who has final say in that because the past two years of, especially color guard uniforms, have been questionable to say the least, <laughs> um, according to folks within our district and without our, not in our district. Um, so I, I Sometimes it is, and I'm I'm not trying to offend anyone. Sometimes it is um, a thought or a um, creative license that you know. Sometimes, especially men, have a lot of a certain thought in mind that doesn't always come to fruition in the fashion. Um, so it, there may just need to be a slight oversight. Please. As far as needing you new you new uniforms, I will try English tonight. Um, I'm sure that that's appropriate. Um, does anybody have any? I mean, I, nobody brought up questions about ACTI budget, but 
I do that. So okay, how are you feeling about it? Um, being in the being I've heard about on CTI, huh? Like I want to sit over there and I want to be like, show me every penny, you know, which I do obviously because I'm me. But like I love them, and he went over everything with me. He took me toward me to school. I met all the teachers. Had some pretty great food, which was fabulous. Um, but most important, hey, I met students. students. <laughs> And I got to hear their experiences. And so there is like a little bit of an increase that they're they're asking for. Um, but it's desperately needed support because there's like three people running all of it. Um Sean is is basically the Sharon. And then there's just two council women, you know, doing everything else. Um so they do, they do need a little bit of help over there, especially with the changes to come in. And this, and this year, they're kind of separating from Gettysburg. So they're becoming like their standalone. I mean, we're all in it, but they're a standalone school now, kind of. Yes. That's the best way I can explain it. Um, so they do kind of really need, and it's, it's like, not that I like raising financials, but it's like per school and per student, it's like three. Yeah, it's 3% overall increase. Yeah. But it's valid. It's not just like hiding in there. The little bit that I and Meredith probably agrees with me on this, the little bit that we heard leading into when we covered the, the meeting before you took on the role for us. Thank you again. Um, hearing what they said then, they didn't have a budget finalized, but I did expect a little bit. And when I saw that it was just that little bit, you know, that 3%, I was like, I had no questions. I figured if there was concern, you would have brought it back to us. I don't think they raised anything on anything except asking for maybe like another person or two staff wise. And they've been working kind of understaffed from what I, and I don't, trust me, I did. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I think I like that. Good. Yeah, a couple of my questions are actually two of them related to fund reduction. And so the first one is within the cooperative education, there's a $75,000 increase. Do we have any what's going away? Yes. So they utilize the Perkins grant um, to fund. And so that it will look like that there's a decrease because um, that was picked up. 80% of the salary was picked up by the Perkins grant. Um, so that certainly accounts for that. And so it's reallocated. Okay. So they got it. They were able to secure a grant. Yes. So, okay. Uh, and then in the office of the director, there was an eighty thousand dollar increase for that's professional the staff. Services. That's the staff. That's the, like the one kind of random chunk. If you just look at it, and that's what I was referring to is that it's just the three people. It's a very very small staff. So he's asking for that to be part of getting extra support. Whether that, however, they cut the pie, be it they hire one or two extra people, or they kind of pay the, the seven teachers, like if they have an extra block in the morning or whatever, like, mm -hmm. hey, can you take on these tasks officially yes. to take the load off of the two girls okay. who, I mean, they do a lot. Okay. I'm sure Lori can do um, you guys too. Additionally, I think that um, they wanted to have money in the budget if they wanted to pursue the grant funds. So I believe mm -hmm. it was um, the company called GMS Funding Solutions. And uh, also NOVAC strategic advisors to help identify and pursue grants I think to help with the potential of the building. They have been talking about that for the past couple of years. Um, and you know, the latest I knew is that uh, particular line on them could be a placeholder for that. If we all collectively feel like we might be ready for them to be able to do that. Okay. So is that so an example would be that that role would be to find grants that would offset the 75 yes. day right. which is one of the group. tasks that the two girls are yes. currently trying okay. to shove in this eight hour day. Right. Um okay. And then the last question was uh seventy thousand dollars being eliminated from item two six six zero. 2660. So those were um, safety cameras, which was the one time purchase through the safety grant. Yeah, it's a one time purchase. Mm -hmm. Okay.
And Sean did give a very much better explanation to this than I just. I think you did great. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's recorded too, if I'm correct. So if you wanted like a better okay. explanation or for you guys, um, I think it's recorded too. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on the finance items? So does this change our budget for anything going forward? The three percent interest. No, I account. That's okay. That would count. Um, in reference to number four, is there any reason why they don't do a fundraiser for that? That's a great question. So um, historically, the, the school district has, has provided the uniforms and then our booster clubs, in this case, the music booster club, um, would raise funds for any of the additional um, items, such as raincoats for a marching band, for example. Um, our current uh, raincoats are 24 years old, so I do know that the music boosters are interested in raising funds to be able to provide now that we are having the conversation of uh, replacing the 70, yes, the 70 marching band uniforms, which are over 11 years old. So we have a replacement cycle every 10 years. So we're already a little bit behind on that cycle. Um, so they are year 11, we're going into year 12. And what fund does that come in? That's a, <laughs> that's a budgeted line item yeah, in exactly. this year's budget. If yeah. they were planned. They were planned. Right. Already. right. I, it will come out of this current budget. There's funds set aside for purchases. So it won't, it won't affect next the point. Okay. And do we have... Do we get to approve what they pick? I mean, I know the other year, you know, they had t-shirts with cauldrons and, you know, the year we had the witch and all that stuff, but some people did not care for it. That wasn't their marching competitive uniform. No. Their marching competitive uniform is, at least to my knowledge, is this really thick polyester, like, yes. okay. Formal, formal. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's like for the parades and things like in our competition. Okay. Can you ask what color it would be? Is that what you said? Uh, no, I just for the um, football and such when they do those performances, their color guard um, <laughs> uniforms were not quite what they should have been um, coverage wise. So we're, we're looking to make sure that that is somehow has higher approval. <laughs> and those, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the color guard uniforms are actually different and separate from the marching yes. band yes. uniforms. They get those every year. Yes. I don't know if the boosters that is that, that is true. Like that. I don't know where it comes from, but when I saw that their marching band uniforms were up for discussion placement, I want to make sure that that because I always forget. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. so I just, I just want to make sure that we're we're putting our best. Costumes forward. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion in finance? Okay. Then let's go ahead and move to ways and means. And we have in ways and means, we've got uh, items one through six. Is there any discussion? Hearing any, then we will go ahead and move on to property and supplies. We have items one through five. Any discussion question? Dr. Perry, and then your drawing for the NOV building plan. Was that open field space on the opposite side for the? For the little football players. Okay, that's 
that was that pool hall area. That's moved right. from the side to yes, this. Yes, correct. Okay. And there's, um, it gets them off the main road and there's access to parking. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. Just tucks them back in a little bit more. Okay. Um, is there a, um, is it just in policies or the handbook or whatever, the rules, the contract, the renters of the fields? Is there a contract they have to sign when they rent it? Yes. Like, don't do dumb stuff? Yes. Yeah, can't be a jerk. Correct. It's great. Okay. Don't, don't, don't damage. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You probably use prettier words, but we don't use, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't, is it, I don't think the word jerk is in there. No. no. Or maybe it's. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other discussion items? Yes, um, actually I did have just, and this is just a comment more or less, uh, more than a question. Um, James Baker has already sent out the invitations to the alumni, assuming that we are going to okay his May 4th use of the cafeteria. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I just feel like if this is an annual thing that we should prepare ahead of time and have it approved, before we send out the invitations. First year I got invited in the five plus years that I've been out of school. <laughs> oh, okay. thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, I noticed. <laughs> they chat is right on it. Have done it a week later. And, you know, in the past, they've yeah. always done it a week later. Um, and I do know that there were, have been some conversations. They had to leave it up a week. This also happens to be from the weekend. Mm. So um, I don't know if that had anything to do with that. I don't know because they were changing that. And, and, that and I can understand that sometimes things happen. Thank you. For but the that. fact that yeah. the, I'm, the invitations are printed, they're on Facebook, they're being sent out. And, you know, if we decide to not allow it, he's in trouble. Okay. So. We wouldn't want to set a precedent for that. Or more right. importantly. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it. letting me know that. All right. Mm -hmm. Any other items? Okay. Then let's go ahead and move to the next agenda item, which is the superintendent's report. Dr. Perry. Good evening, everyone. So um just as a reminder as this being the first item um, under my report is that we will have a voting session once the study session is adjourned, um, recommending the approval of our lowest bidder, Fadivia, um, as our construction manager for NOE and uh, CTE. So that will be happening this evening. Um, also, I'd like to provide a, a brief update on our Athletics Board subcommittee um, that took place. And of course, you know, our board members are able to uh, jump in at any time. Um, essentially, Mr. Worley provided an athletics update regarding the fall and the winter seasons. Uh, we're really happy with the, the co-op that we have for girls um, lacrosse with Dewan Catholic. And so essentially what that is for the members of the board is that we partner with um, our nine pubs to, for their students to be able to participate with our teams. Um, so that's really been a positive event. So we appreciate the board's cooperation for allowing that. Uh, we did review the athletic uh, coach handbook. It is in the process of being updated um, the board members will be reviewing that and providing feedback at, by our next meeting. Um, we were looking at April 30th as a potential deadline for that feedback to go back. Uh, and then if we need to have any further discussion at our next athletics board subcommittee on May 7th, we're able to do so. So that's good. Um, we did discuss the dress code. You know, so there have been mentions about how our colonials are showing up. Um, both on and off the field. And so we did engage in some discussion around that. And uh, most particular with our coaches and game day dress code, um, which we identified as being in our coach handbook on page 15. 
Also furthermore, Mr. Worley and I are exploring the possibility of changing the site for our swimming team. Our swimming team is growing. Uh, currently, um, Brother and Home holds a site for us, for our, our students to practice. Um, it is not a competitive pool, however, so we can never host our own site. Uh, so we are looking into that possibility at the Hanover North YMCA um, due to the increasing numbers and the interest of both the students and the coaches. <laughs> so we're looking for a proposal from the ride, and then we'll have further discussion and consideration as part of our next meeting on May 2nd. Uh, we also explored the possibility of using other school district schools, you know, such as Southwestern, and often those times are not conducive. There are the, um, the times that they're not using it, which is typically uh, 5 to 7 a.m., so not conducive for our team. And we also uh, did talk about increasing our athletics facility use charges overall. Um, so we will be continuing and there will be a recommendation that will come back on uh, May 2nd, 2024. But also we wanted to celebrate um, the Boost for Club and their activities in terms of upgrading and purchasing chairs for our high school gym, which we appreciate. And um, our current high school scoreboard is for 1989 and they're looking uh, for an upgrade through a company called Power Ad. And what Power Ad does is it helps us to find sponsors and contracts. And they're looking to remove our scoreboard and put new ones up and all costs would be through the booster clubs. So we're gonna to continue to discuss that and see what the feasibility might look like. And uh, finally, the booster club is looking at a score table that is covered. So, and that, mobile. Yes, and mobile. and mobile, that's exactly right. So that concludes you know, the, the conversation that we had. Was there anything that our board members would like to add that I may have missed? I think that, I believe you mentioned that you had hoped to curtail the public walking and exercises on the property. Not necessarily on the property, just certain parts of it, like up against the building. Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. That was not specific to athletics. We. Um, you know, we did talk about for the track. The context it, was yeah. the track and how does our community access, you know, our our site. Um, it did come up that we would look at, you know, a way of signing into the track to use the track as a walking space. And then we did have the sidebar conversation about how um, we do have community members that will walk that exact perimeter of our building, particularly on this campus between um, the high school, middle school, and district office. So, you know, how we, we have cur curtailed that, that's going to be a conversation as a part of our board policy committees as we progress through our policy review cycle. Um, you know, that's going to be a much longer conversation that's going to impact our facilities. It's also a part of the overall security plan yeah. assessment. So they're kind of taking the from, uh, security recommendations and it will have a uh, trickle down, a ripple effect on many things such as access to uh, the building and or friends. So you are thinking of opening the track again? Is that what they said? The track is open. What we're looking at is um, curtailing access to the track during the school day when we have students who are okay. on the field. That we would look to have very clear parameters of use, and that way there's no confusion. Um, but then part of that is we have to communicate that to the community and provide the explanation. But the community details. can use it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what we're one of the things that was brought up, um, brought to our attention, and the reason that although it's going to be an overall safety plan, um, the the fact that I can go in and walk the track when they're trying to have track practice, right, uh, no. it doesn't work. But right. some community members do not fully comprehend that it's really not okay. So we have to come up with a way to make sure that those types of things are being handled. 
as well as, you know, if you decide to take a walk in the, you know, at lunchtime, because it's the only warm time of the day, um, perhaps walking the, sorry, it's medicine time, um, <laughs> you know, perhaps walking the exterior of the campus is okay, but walking right here along these windows and up, you know, the steps to the auditorium and back out, probably not the greatest thing to do when kids are in class. So some of us understand that and some of us need some guidance. So we just have to figure out the best way to explain it. All right. And Dr. Turner, we're about to the assistance. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, just two updates for you. Right? Uh, next week, you're going to be voting on the special education plan that I presented and shared with you last month. Um, so just letting you know that it's been on public um, site so that people can provide feedback. Dr. Corbin has been diligently checking that feedback um, and looking to see if there's any adjustments that need to be made at this time that is not. Um, so we will we'll be bringing this to you next week for a vote. And the other um, update that I have is Jess right here um, has been shown great interest in joining the fund that we have in comprehensive planning. That must been a selling pretty well if you want to be joined. Uh, so she has been talking with me the last month or so about what it entails to be part of the steering committee. And Jess brings a really wide breadth of knowledge with her as an educator, as a parent of a junior in high school that is play several um, sports and also just as a community member. So um, Jess kind of gave it a, a try um, this month and I think the last month and she's hooked, so she likes it. Um, so she wants in, so I guess we'll let her. Um, you'll determine that. Um, but she was able to attend our last comprehensive planning meeting in March, was at the end of March. And she would like to join the steering committee. So I bring her name um, to the board for you to vote on that next week um, for her to join. And she'll be representing the high school as a parent. On the steering committee. Thank you. Something. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> right now. It's great. <laughs> My husband said, What's he selling? <laughs> goals. Yeah, yeah goals. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yes. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Stern. All right. And then we'll uh, move on to public comment. Uh, first is comment on agenda related items. I don't have any uh, signed in advance, uh, but I'll open the floor up. Are there any comments from the public on agenda items? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, two questions. Yeah. One is I assume you can do presentations from tonight. Are going to be posted this week? Can you post it? Yes. Can that be this week? Yes, the uh, feasibility study will be posted tomorrow morning from Crabtree Work Park. And then the budget, I'm assuming, would be posted tomorrow. And then the other, just to see if I'm understanding correct, if we storm pass, what would the budget be if it was zero taxes? But the question was the index was 5% of the index. I understand the process right that if you went with zero taxes and you'd have to have a zero index, it was somewhere like a three and a half million dollar drop in that budget number. Am I not uh, the five uh, percent was just a, a number I was throwing out. That's not what the index was. Our index was actually 7.2. So um, without any tax increase, you would be looking at probably a drop of. About it would probably be about two point seven million dollars. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? About online? Not online. Not online. Okay. Then we will move to non-agenda items. Are there any public comments on non-agenda items? All right, how about online? Not online. Not online. Okay, thank you. Then we will move to items recommended for board action, which is in findings.
Yes, I'd like to uh, recommend that uh, we vote on item number one, the uh, approval of Idelia as our construction manager for the renovations to the NLE and the CTP. I second. Is there any discussion? Let's take a roll call vote. Mr. Buckley? Yes. Mr. Meckley? Yes. Mrs. Souter? Yes. Ms. Crude? Yes. Mr. Flickinger? Yes. Mrs. Swope? Yes. Mrs. Miller? Yes. Mr. Getz? Yes. And Mr. Kinshu? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'll go over dates to remember. Uh, next Monday, the 8th, we have a board meeting starting at 7.30. On Tuesday, the 9th, we have the policy subcommittee, which will begin at 6 p.m. Reminder to all the board to uh, provide your feedback uh, to Dr. Ferry um, on that review. It's I think it's like policies 1 through 16. Uh, and then on Thursday, May 2nd, we have the athletic subcommittee meeting on, uh, that's a Thursday at 6 p.m. And then on Monday, May 6th, we have our next study session, which is 7 p.m. Next, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You can call the meeting adjourned at 9.26. Thank the members of the public for attending. Uh, we will have an executive session.